Hi, I am Dr. Corey Wong, and we're starting our first module on oppression by focusing on an article written by Marilyn Fry. Before we get into it, I want to just note that in talking about oppression overall, the purpose here is going to be getting into the concept of oppression, but we're going to be looking at it largely through a lens of gender and gender-based oppression, so things like sexism. But that doesn't mean that this is only applicable to say, women, or those who experience oppression based on their gendered identities. Instead, this is a framework to understand oppression overall that I think can be useful for understanding how racism works, classism works, ableism works, and homophobia, and all those other isms, so that we can see that oppression uh, based on social identity categories is similar in structure it's just that right now we're talking about gender-based oppression that focuses on gendered experiences of oppression itself. And this is a really amazing piece because she is trying to give a brief introduction for the notion of oppression itself. Basically, she starts out by saying that in order to really understand oppression and do anti-oppression work, we have to know what it is that we're talking about. And one thing that can happen is that we throw around the word oppression without fully meaning, knowing what we mean when we say oppression. So she does a really good job of explaining that, well, some people are oppressed and others are not. And one way that we can understand that experience is not by saying that just any hindrance or challenge that we can experience in life is then an example or evidence of oppression. At the very beginning, she says, if we don't want to stretch this word into meaningless, we have to understand that it's wrong to treat oppression as though its scope includes any and all human experience or limitation or suffering, no matter the cause, degree, or consequence. And that is a really helpful way to frame that oppression is linked to cause, degree, and consequence and not just one hindrance of life. Because sometimes that's just life. Sometimes life is just hard. That doesn't mean you're oppressed. So anyway, in order to get into what oppression is, she starts pretty basically with a definition. The root of the word oppression is to press. And that's a very good image to come up with because she's talking about how presses are used to mold or squeeze or flatten something. So she says that something pressed is something caught between or among forces and barriers which are so related to each other that jointly they restrain, restrict, or prevent the thing's motion or mobility. So mold, immobilize, and reduce. And that's the sense that we want to get from oppression. It's this constraining or restriction of movement. And that's not just physical movement. We can think about it in terms of life movement, movement through options, having choices to be able to pursue and progress or move forward. So oppression then metaphorically can be also understood as the experience of restriction, constraint, or immobilization through one's options or choices to be able to pursue and, and move freely through the world. One of the examples that she says is a quintessential experience of oppression is that of the double bind. So the double bind is an experience that really harks to this notion of immobilization where you can't go this way without incurring some consequence and you can't go this way without taking on a penalty. Marilyn Fry says, situations in which options are reduced to a very few and all of them expose one to penalty, censure, or deprivation. So regardless of whatever option you take, you're going to be hit with some kind of penalty or retribution or consequence that's negative. That's a mark of an oppressed experience. So an example of a double bind experience that like women could perhaps feel or experience in the workplace is associated with the perception of being bossy or arrogant or conceited or controlling or aggressive, where if you show up competently and speak your mind, state your views, take up space legitimately in say a meeting or a workspace, then you could be deemed all of those negative things that make you unfit, unfriendly, a little too cocky, too overbearing, and then that can be a negative perception of you as a woman. But if you don't show up in those sorts of ways, and instead you are very meek or overly friendly or just very nice and caring and warm, now you might de be deemed as incompetent or underexperienced or soft or not equipped to be a leader. So if you show up because of gendered expectations for women, you are necessarily going to be towing a very fine line that if you lean one way, you could be hit with penalties for being bossy and then unfit for a certain role. 
or you go the other way and now you're going to be assessed negatively for a whole slew of different reasons, but either way, it's hard to show up as a woman. That's an example of a double bind. You're caught in the bind, caught between systematically related pressures and either way you can't win. That's the catch-22 double bind experience that is a signature mark of oppression. Then Marilyn Fry goes on to explain that women are caught in a double bind by networks of forces and barriers that expose one to these penalties, loss or contempt, whether one works within or outside of the home. Exam she gives all these examples of what that looks like. But here is where um, we get into a really important discussion of oppression as a systematic structure in society that creates that double bind experience of being immobilized and not having options without penalty. She says that um, oppression then is understood through these networks of forces or barriers and that they exist, all these factors exist in, com in a complex tension with every other penalizing or prohibiting all of the apparent available options. And to this, she gives the very apt imagery of a birdcage. So she says that the experience of oppressed people is that of living of one's life and confined and shaped by forces and barriers, which are not just accidental or occasional, because in that case, then they could be avoidable. It's just an accident that it, it occurred, so you could work around it. But in the case of oppression, these hindrances and barriers are systematically related to each other in such a way as to catch one between and among them in restrict or penalize motion in any direction. So this is the experience of being caged in. All avenues in every direction are blocked or booby trapped. This is a slightly different image from just a double bind. The double bind is like one way you're penalized, another way you're hit with negative consequences. But sometimes oppression itself can feel like you have no way to move. And that is a, it's a different image that really brings this notion of there are no available options, even though it seems like you could um, do something. Part of what's really valuable about Marilyn Fry's presentation of the birdcage metaphor to understand what oppression is, is that it allows us to understand the difference between a microscopic view of a problem and a macroscopic view. So she says that the microscopic view would be taking very close scrutiny on just one wire of a birdcage. And if you look at this one wire, you say, okay, yeah, I can see how that's inhibiting your movement. That's a hindrance, but why don't you just go around it? Or it's just one thing, so it's not that big of a deal. But the systematic relationship between a network of forces is that they are joined together in such a way that their interplay creates that prevention of mobilization so that when you look, take a few steps back and look at the birdcage, you see it's the relationship of these forces, not the existence of just one itself that creates that immobilization. So um, she says that it's perfectly obvious then that the bird is surrounded by a network of systematically related barriers, no one of which would be the least hindrance to a bird's flight, but which by their relation to each other are as confining as the solid walls of a dungeon, even though a bird cage is very airy. There's a lot of space in between that we could see it, we can look to it, it's not opaque, yet with, it doesn't have to be thick concrete walls to prevent movement. It's the relationship of those forces. Um, so here's an, an example to understand how, how and why oppression is captured through the relationships of networks and barriers. If we were to look at one wire of a birdcage, this metaphor, metaphorical birdcage, we could use the example of when men will go out of their way, even if they are hindered and burdened by boxes and packages and carrying things, to open the door for women. Now some may say, well, this is just chivalry. It's not oppression. We're just being kind to help women make their way into buildings. Um, and Marilyn Fry examines this example by saying, okay, yeah, if we look at that one wire, we may not think that's the biggest thing. Just deal with one instance when someone's being nice to you. But if people take offense to the fact that men will go out of their way to open the door for women and claim it is chivalry, this has a lot of other consequences when we take a few steps back and look at a more systemic level because the implication there is that women are needing to have doors open for them, that they are frail and can't navigate the world without the assistance or escorting of men. It's not bad to open the door for people, by the way. <laughs> it is a courtesy to be thoughtful and open the door for another person, but the insistence that men will sometimes have for insisting that women walk through the door is a misplaced sense of help. And Marilyn Fry goes in to explain that this form of help, of opening the door, 
is actually an occurrence that is counter to a very strong pattern where men in the world are not helpful for women in very practical ways more practical ways in which women might actually welcome men's help. So it's not so important for me that a man will open the door, and I'm not necessarily taking offense just to the fact that he's opening the door. What is more offensive to me is that that is the expression of help and care from a man, whereas what might be more welcomed are instances with, that women would experience in a world, this is Marilyn Fry speaking, where uh, men are much more eager to help with mundane affairs and situations, of threat, assault, or terror. So that would be like helping with the laundry or helping prepare dinner or helping to take care of the kids or dealing with the emotional labor of planning family events and social events with friends or also taking on a little extra responsibility if work is really heavy one night or in all these other instances like not making uh, a threatening nighttime environment when a woman just wants to walk through the world. If men wanted to be super helpful and really help a woman make her way through space, it would be nice for men to not attack women, to not harass women, and to not catcall women and make them feel intimidated or afraid. Those are more examples of how men can help women move more easily through the world and why an insistence on opening the door is a misguided place for this chivalry or a sense of care and protection for women. That it's offensive because it fails to take into account the larger systems that make uh, the world a hostile place for women to live. So there's no practical meaning behind the symbolic gesture of opening the door if that's not backed up with more meaningful and substantive examples of men really wanting to protect and serve and support women. So another way to think about this birdcage metaphor that can be really helpful for understanding the experiences people can have of oppression is by understanding microaggressions. Now microaggressions are those subtle slights or comments that may often come off as like well-intentioned or benign, but overall have a cumulative effect of being snubs or slights that are like actually really awful for people to experience. Now if you were to say, well, it's just one person saying something a little maybe offhand to you that you're being too sensitive about, that would be like looking at one wire and saying, well, that whatever, get over it, just walk around it, it's not hindering your ability to move through the world. But microaggressions are problematic because it's not just that it happens once, it's the incessant cumulative effect of all these different subtle interactions that when taken together in a more macroscopic view, you can see that it, there is a significant weight and burden of undergoing all those microaggressions. So especially um, now that we have language around microaggressions, I think that that is helpful for understanding why people will call out microaggressions as a mark of oppression, because you have to understand them on the larger scale as the whole and not just this one particular instance. That's a helpful way to also think about those who might be marked with um, privilege in entering into a conversation around oppression of saying, but I'm oppressed too. Or if someone does this to me, then that's them oppressing me. To go back to what Marilyn Fry is originally saying, this isn't oppression. Oppression isn't just, I had a hard time too once. Oppression is much more about a systematic relation of various different forces and networks that create those barriers for one's success or flourishing. So one could say that, uh, let's take the example of say men, there are plenty of men who have had the experience of being objectified. And objectification we could say is one of the, one of the ways in which women in our culture can be frequently oppressed through objectification. So yes, it's also true that men can be objectified, but the one or handful of times that men are objectified is not the same as all the other things that would relate to a woman's oppression, which would include objectification and inequities and pay and threats of violence just by living in the world and ex extra burdens of having to support and care for more people and all these other things. So yes, other people can have an experience of a birdcage wire, like a microaggression of being objectified if you're coming from other identities and not just identifying as a woman, for instance. But that may not be itself indicative that one has the experience of oppression because it's how they relate to one another that makes the oppressive experience what it is.